Yo, this is a motherfucker who needs no introduction. You are watching Breaking Records Radio. Right, Breaking Records Radio in the place to be. You know what it is, your host Maloney, and I got a very, 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 very special guest with me right now. The legendary Chisnock Shock Claire. Um, you know, this man, this man is a not not just a legend in Canadian and Toronto hip hop, but the this this man has moved mountains for the generation of today to be able to do what they do. And um, you know, I think I, I think it's I think it's imperative that the younger generation put some respect on the Chisnock's name. You know what I'm saying? Well, we got Shock <laughs> Claire with us right here, man. How's it going, man? Man, I'm good. How are you, brother? How are you doing? I can't complain, man. You know, um, I, I'm waiting for the world to get back to normal. But aside from that, you know, I can't complain about a damn thing. You know. I hear you. I hear you. Well, you know, much blessings to uh, you and the fam, except especially during this season. You know, happy holidays, Merry yeah. Christmas, brother. Yeah, you too, brother. You too. And, um, you know, you got you got a lot of history that I, you know, I want to talk about. And as me and Dan talked before, you know, um, once, once things once we get back to a, some normalcy, we'll, we'll do a dope in-person interview. But um, so I'm going to try to leave some stones unturned. But, <laughs> um, you know, you got so much history to go over. But I want to start with what's going on right now, because um, you just put out the brand new single, The uh, One Day Away, which is really, really, really dope. And um, I just want you to tell us a little bit about kind of, um, well, first off, I know that you and Classified were in the studio and you guys got some, you guys got a handful of stuff you've been cooking. I don't know exactly what you can let out the bag and what you can't, but um, I know that he's uh, worked heavily with you over these last few singles you put out. And I was just kind of curious um, to one, the process that went into One Day Away and uh, kind of the whole the whole kind of concept of uh, you and Classified even getting together to bang out a large uh, a large portion of music to begin with. Uh, well, yeah, definitely. Well, it all it kind of all started um, just initially when uh, he was doing the the Canadian Classic Tour. I don't know if it was called that at the time, um, but I remember getting a call in September, and um, he was just like, "Yeah, you want to come on the road? It'll be me, you, and Maestro, and whatever." So we went and we did that tour, which was an amazing tour. And then once we got off the tour, uh, a class ended up calling Dan and said, "Yo, I have this idea. Like, let's go and work on some records. I'll produce it, whatever." And then we said, "Word." And then we went down there. I think it was May. I think three days from Sunday to Wednesday, um, and we banged out nine tracks. Wow, or sorry, okay. seven tracks, sorry, seven tracks, seven tracks. We banged wow. out seven tracks. Uh, yeah, we just, we were in the studio from like 11 till two every day and people would come over, Old Sound, Ivy, Mike Boyd, uh, Ebenezer, Evil Ebenezer, like, you know, like people would come through. And- uh, Well, Evil was out there while you guys were recording too, eh? Yeah, he just happened to be out there. Like, it wasn't like uh, a planned thing. It was just like, yo, he's here he's like yeah come through we're here doing this and uh so like you know so we you know so we did a bunch of records and right now we just released a three and then uh we did hurt everybody which was the first one around last year this time and then yeah. backdraft uh uh we, that just came out a couple months ago and then just this wednesday uh one day away so uh yeah we just kind of it was just the energy of the tour just brought that right into us going into the studio spending three days over there banging out seven tracks and now you're just only hearing three of them <laughs> wow that's crazy man and I, like i told dan um when we spoke um on a phone call recently but i said like um this is before the one day away joint drop but that um backdraft man like that that's one of my favorite songs I've I've heard from you since probably like the Blake Savage or the Ice Cold days. You know what I mean? Like that that track was like, whoa! Like it was like it was a whole like it was like an elevated shot, Claire. And just the way you and Classified's production worked together, it was like, um, you know, because obviously you had done the Quit While You're Ahead with them in the past and stuff like that, which was another phenomenal record. But um, just the the energy you guys had, like it was like I was like, damn. Damn, I wish you guys would have done this sooner. You know what I mean? But um, <laughs> it's it's phenomenal that you guys went in there and knocked all this stuff out in three days. Like the the energy just must, you know, it it really must have just been an organic vibe in there. Well, yeah. Well, you know what? It was because even before the tour, you know, we were all cool with each other. We all knew each other, um, uh, for the most part. Um, but after the tour and going through that tour, uh, like 
I think it was almost like 38 days, uh, so many shows in 38 days, like almost like 33 or something like that. So, so all yeah. that time being on the road, like we just kind of grew this kind of vibe that solidified our friendship from before. And I think that was the energy because we, we came off the road in November and now here is May and we're still kind of floating off of like being on the road for almost, you know, for like a month and some, and, uh, you know, and uh, we just put it into the music. It came out really dope. And uh, we're both fans of each other. So I guess when you're working with people that you like and respect and you appreciate, uh, that work goes in. And and I believe it's coming out in these songs that you guys are hearing right now. Yeah, definitely. And, and it sounds inspired, you know. That's one thing I find, like, you know, with uh, some of our OGs, um, like, I have to salute that they continue to put out music. But a lot of times it reaches a point where, like, just the fan in me, you know what I mean? Is like, this doesn't have the inspiration it once felt, you know, and, and I don't feel that at all with these three singles you guys have put out. Like it, it sounds like in like, it sounds very motivated, very inspired, like, and, um, you know, and it's just, it's really refreshing to see and really refreshing to hear that from, you know, from our OGs and the legends in the game, the people we look up to for knocking down doors for us, like for it to be 2020 and you guys be putting in work that that's, if not better, if not equally comparable, it's better than the work that you guys were putting in back in the days, you know what I mean? And I think, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's important. It's an important uh, kind of blueprint to be able to show not only just the younger generation, but the other OGs who kind of may not be inspired and stuff. It's important for, you know, you guys to kind of be able to put that out there so people can see, you know, like you can still, you can be 20 years in your career and make some of the best music you've ever made. You know, I feel like a lot of people get stuck on that, like, you know, for you know when you first kind of bubble that that you know and yeah. then they go off and expand and stuff and feel like they can't uh they can't recapture that lightning in the bottle but this is living proof that you you know yeah and you know what and it's one of those things too is like if you look at like like how come like some people will be say that um you know like you can't be re-inspired and and uh do whichever when people are still listening to aerosmith and guns and roses and bon jovi exactly. maybe not guns and roses so much but bon jovi and aerosmith and they come and they do their tour and it's like you know it's it's great to see like how the new generation is moving up and everything and it inspires you on their hustle and how they want to get out there and do some things and whichever um, and, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to mess his quote up a lot, but, uh, I remember reading something from Snoop and he was, uh, saying something about, you know, but you gotta also, when these news cat, these new cats come up, you've got to make sure there's nur uh, 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 nurturing for them as they succeed because they succeed yeah. like us. We used to work like three years just to get our name heard. Now, yeah. you know, these guys could blow up in a month. And yeah. it happens so fast, but then they don't have anything behind people to go and uh, really go and, you know, kind of steer their train, you know, in the right way. So yeah. that, yeah. yeah so, and, you know, it's almost like too much too soon. Like a lot of these young cats is exactly that. Like they blow up overnight and they haven't necessarily put their 10,000 hours in and they, once all this money and attention comes, they don't know what to do with it, you know? Right. And, and you know, a lot of, a lot of cats make, you know, bad decisions. Um, you know, and it, it and it's sad to see, but you know, a lot of the young, like, there's a lot of a lot of um, a lot of sad things happening to the new generation right now in hip hop. Whether it's all these indictments that are going around, the the continuous murders, like, it's just, you know, it's just unfortunate. And I think I think there is a disconnect there with the OGs and the younger generation, where there isn't exactly what you said that nurturing that needs to be there. And um, you know, I think it's yeah. important. Well, look at all, look at like some of the guys like the, the Jeezy's or the Rick Ross's or the YG's or uh, even like a Wiz Khalifa. And, you know, if you look at like some of these guys and even Kendrick Lamar's look who took them under almost like under a wing, you know, yeah. like the Diddy stepped up the French Montana. There's another one, uh, yeah. you know, uh, but the Diddy stepped up and said, yo, let me guide you. Uh, you yeah. know, and, uh, you know, the Dr. Dre's and the Jay-Z's and whichever. So it's one of those things. And um, hopefully it's getting there. But I am seeing recently with a lot of new music coming out uh, that a lot of people are really um, going back and using like maybe like when 90s, we used to use 80s and 70s samples. They're using 90s samples 90s now samples. Yeah. for for now. And so at least in that way, they're looking back that way. And it's good to it's good to see it. I appreciate that. It's really great. It's pretty cool, eh? And you know what's funny? Like, because I started producing around 2010, and um, 
that like I grew up on 90s music, right? I was born in 89. So 90s music is my shit, but I always felt like it was corny to sample it because you know it was like it was like too easy. You know what I mean? So it's like all these years <laughs> I've been thinking back and like sampling soul music and you know all this stuff before my time and then just like, you know, before you know it like Hitmaker and stuff like that they start making a kill and sampling all these 90s hits. I'm like, you can't, you kidding me. I wanted to sample this 20 million times. I thought, that was, I thought that wasn't allowed. You know what I mean? It's like, but. You know, the no crazy way. thing is, is when I, when I first started to be like, okay, yeah, this is actually really what's going on was um, I listened to the song a, a, a lot, um, Uproar by Lil Wayne, because yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. I like that special delivery. Yeah. And then I remember playing it for somebody. I forget. I think I was at. Dan's brother's house and there was like some cats there and they only thought that that was that one song and then I play them the original and they're looking at the TV like oh this came out before and I'm like yo bro that when I hear that beat that's special delivery but I do like uproar still so yeah, yeah. it's funny how it's Every working time I hear it, I just think fuck the whole industry yeah <laughs> goes you, you on that ghost face verse <laughs> yeah man <laughs> or the Craig Mack the um the Craig Sorry, Mack coming Craig in. Mack on that, you know, yeah. you must want to be in the Guinness Book of World Records as the dumbest, the dumbest motherfucker, motherfucker alive. alive. <laughs> Boy, it yeah. won't survive. Yo, <laughs> rest in peace, Craig Mack. Dude. Yeah, rest in peace, Craig Mack, for real. <laughs> but, um, you know, one thing that you, you mentioned, um, there's two things you mentioned, actually, that I kind of want to branch off with. So before I, I mix up and forget, um, the first thing I wanted to go with was um, you talking about like uh, the energy coming off of the, the tour with class and the uh, Canadian classics uh, tour and the energy and then kind of transferring that into the studio. Was that reminiscent to you of the days of like when you guys were hustling in the beginning, like the knee deep records days and when you guys, you know, were touring Canada and stuff after Northern Touch and, you know, like all you and the, you know, the circle and everything, like all those collab, you know, because you guys used to work so tightly together. Was, was it kind of reminiscent of that kind of vibe and energy? Absolutely. It absolutely was because yeah. when like when like back in the circle days, uh, one either me well road wasn't driving at the time. So it was either me or socks driving. And we were like the only three from Scarborough Cardi and all those guys were from Eglinton West or somewhere West and that side. So me yeah. socks and Cardi always would drive and one of us would be like, yo, you know, and the studio we went to was that like Jane and Dundas. And so we were like, someone's going to drive. Can you drive or can them drive? So, um, but so we were always in the studio together just because that's why Socks is even at the first beginning of Let's Ride because we were just at the studio together and it was like, yeah, I don't know, we got like 24 bars before I even start rapping, say something. <laughs> so there, there's his speech at the beginning because he was there. He was like, fill it, please. <laughs> Type no, thing. That, that goes on to be like the classic, one of the most classic Canadian hip hop things of all time. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it was because Cardi thought I couldn't rap on that beat. He thought it was too fast for me. Uh, I'll really? go get into that. Uh, yeah, he did. Um, but yeah, but it was. It was just like that because that's how we did all our songs in before. And you can see it through the Ice Cold records, the Memoirs records, and even stuff on the My Demo records. Um, you know, so like like I was saying, it's like we just went to classes and we were there. Like we, you know, we wake up in the morning, the studio's like, at his house so wake up in the morning he either he's there or i'm there and then he comes in and we're there and then we just work and then o sound shows up ivy shows up mike boyd shows up this guy shows up that guy shows up and then all of a sudden it's 10 p.m and we're still going and we've got three tracks done so it was just exactly like that vibe for sure that's awesome man and i think and you know i think that's one thing especially with today's um with how accessible making music is nowadays, I think a lot of people take for granted the importance of like that interaction. Like you could record from home, make some great music and stuff, but there's nothing like when you're in the studio with other like-minded individuals and you know, and you're working together. And like, even if like, you know, yeah, you pen your own verses and stuff, but like you could be like reciting it and homie might be like, yo, like, but like, what if you like said that like that? Or what if you tweak that like that? Or like, what about like this for the hook? You like, are you, know, ab you are absolutely right. I, and um, you know, like I do features with people. So sometimes, you know, like we just don't get a chance to get in studio to eat with each other. Yeah. So, you know, you go there and then you send your parts. I could tell you some of, some of my best experiences in life was being in studio recording with the people that I've recorded with. 
I saw yeah. somebody this morning posted Young Guns from Ice Cold with me and Memphis Bleak. Man, Memphis Bleak to me was the hottest thing at that point, like as far as the lyrics was concerned. And I thought he was fire on there. And then I'm yeah. like so excited. And we go into D&D Studios, which we know that history. Um, Primo. Yeah. And I go into <laughs> D&D Studios and I'm recording this track and then I'm there with Memphis. And like, you know, he's like you're saying, he's asking me, yo, you think this can work or how do you feel like it? I'm like, you're Memphis bleak. Like you, you're asking me, <laughs> you know, but like that interaction was very cool. And I, I have a very beautiful, lovely story about when I did the track with me and old dirty bastard rest in peace to guru. But I remember guru. I went to D and D studios again, recorded with guru from Gangstar in the B room is Black Moon, which anybody that knows me from, that was my group. It was always Souls of Mischief for Black Moon. And I was Black Moon all the way. And uh, yeah, and they're recording in the other room. And then I'm over in the other, um, I go and I move this session with the big fat two inch tape pieces. So we move the session to this other room. I, I don't know, maybe it's the C room or something like that. And Black Moon walks in and I'm like, buckshot what up <laughs> and then tony touch comes in and then i'm like you're tony touch now again for anybody if you listen to bear witness from ice cold with me and guru and you hear the scratches at the end that's just because tony touch walked in and said yo i want to fuck with this wow eh? that, 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 pimp pimps holes that's tony touch and they just walked in the studio. So the interaction with going with people and recording with people is much better doing it in person. Uh, but I understand that sometimes you have to do it the way that we're doing it now. Yeah, definitely. You know, and it, it is one of those things where it is some give or take, right? Like, you know, everybody's got schedules and with the accessibility, I understand it. But I think when people like, you know, like that, I, that's what I love, like the fact that when you, you in class locked in and you actually went out there and did it because it just the you get the aesthetic is just so much different when when you're there organically creating and you have that exactly like you said that natural effect where you know evil ebenezer might walk in mike boyd might walk in you know ivy might you know might pop in and the, like just the inspiration of everybody in the room the energy being able to bounce yeah. the ideas off each other just the music comes out like it shows in the music you know what i mean if you guys were to just send verses and beats back and forth i'm sure you guys would have still made something great but it just there's, there's just that feeling, you know what I mean? That you get when it's- When, when you're doing it, like, yeah, when you're, when you're building it together. Imagine this, I send you some prints up to go and uh, you know, some uh, instructions how to build a fence. And so you build it, but you just watch it. But imagine yeah. if me and you are building the fence together, how much better it will come across. It's 100%. just that way. Yeah. Exactly, 100%, <laughs> man. And um, there was something else I wanted to say too, in the regard of the, um, what we were talking about before, but. I can't remember it exactly, but there was actually you bringing up the Memphis Bleak thing was another thing I did want to ask you about because I seen somebody post that this morning as well too, and um, I wasn't actually familiar with you you and Bleak's track. So when I listen, I'm like, yo, this is fire. So um, I know you kind of just broke down a bit of the what the recording experience was like, but how did um like how did you link up with Bleak to do the record to begin with? I think um, that was the benefit of being on a label because I think. Yeah. At that time, I'm trying to remember because I'm trying to remember who, what EMI music was releasing, like their, um, what they were the umbrella of. I know it was Virgin and Priority and somehow, some way, because of that situation, because I just mentioned it. I said, man, they asked me about features and what would I like to do? And then, um, and, uh, and then I, I was like, yeah, man, I'd love to work with Memphis Bleak. And somehow through those channels, they got the word out. And right now, Memphis Bleak has a shocker, ice cold gold record sitting on his wall, shining. That's amazing, right? <laughs> yeah. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah. That is amazing, man. You know, that, that, that's like, it's just, it's just so cool, too, when you think about it. You know what I mean? Like, for you to even, like, to be such a fan of Memphis Bleak at the time and to work with them. And then for you to actually give him a gold, like, you know what I mean? Like, he has yeah, yeah. trophy for the rest I, of the I, I, so, it, like, it, it it like it boggles my mind sometimes because you know you're always looking forward so but then yeah. sometimes when i actually look back and i'm like yeah that was pretty cool 
I was actually thinking the other day, I was like, you know, the first time, I think it was for what it takes. No, it was Let's Ride. It was Let's Ride. So that would have been my second, third Juno, actually. No, or second, whichever one it was. Um, <laughs> I'm talking like I got so many. Um, <laughs> but when I got one, I have the picture of my mom and my grandmother backstage holding like the the you know the envelope with the winner is and my name on it and like those are things that you know like it, you look back on stuff like that and it's like yeah I have that you know like I have that history and um you know sometimes it, I guess sometimes you're always forward thinking sometimes yeah. it's good to look back and just be like you know like and just look and uh, actually appreciate for yourself the things that you have accomplished no 100 percent and you know and, and and I feel that completely like you know because I'm and, and I think, I guess maybe every artist feels like this and like, you know, even, you know, media personality, whatever, but it's like, I never, like, when I look back, sometimes I'm like, whoa, I've interviewed people that like, I never dreamt I would even have conversations with or be in the same room as or whatever. But it's like, you're always constantly working on what's next and trying to accomplish a next goal or a new, you know, and it's like everything that seemed wild five years ago just becomes a benchmark in your, your goal to your next, like to achieve your next goal, your next, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. Some, yeah. And it no, is because it, to, you know what, it's so, it's so good because, okay, look, if I try to look back a little bit, I remember I was doing a festival. I didn't get to see him perform because I left, but I did a festival with James Brown. And I remember him ooh. driving by in his limo. And the only thing you saw was his glove out the window. And it was, everybody was like, that's James Brown. <laughs> I remember doing a show in Maine and ah, man, it, this is so crazy. I was doing this show in Maine. This is like great. Like I'm fresh and new into the American market. So, but like it was a festival and red and meth were supposed to be there, but method man couldn't be there or Ghostface was there and someone else wasn't, there. I don't know, something was happening. And there was this yeah. band that just wasn't, um, that just wasn't, um, you know, uh, meshing with the audience so to say so the audience starts throwing mud and everything i don't know what it, in blouse and skirts told somebody to come and tell me to go and calm the crowd down but they did so here's young fresh and green me walking up on stage in america <laughs> doing a show with red and meth and one of them didn't show and ghost face is here and i don't know and the crowd is throwing mud and i have to go out there and calm them down <laughs> but they calmed down yeah. and then they put me on right at that point and Spence Diamond just just went and grabbed this thing they were like get his records and they grabbed the records all of a sudden the light man is like what kind of lights do you want red or green or purple what, what do you I was like I don't know I'm just here calming the crowd down and then boom yeah. then we did the show rocked it and it was amazing and then I met all of the Wu-Tang guys backstage uh, well all the ones that were there I'm forgetting who wasn't there but yeah, I met all the people that were there after stage. And, you know, these are the memories that I got, you know, when I look back. That's insane, eh? That's, that's <laughs> incredible. Like, just the way certain things happen too, right? You know, like, uh, what's the saying? I'm not going to be able to say it verbatim, but it's like, you know, um, basically, uh, you know, success is when um, hard work and luck meet each other. You know what I mean? It's like, you got to be yeah. in the right place at the right time for when that opportunity presents itself. But if you're not constantly working, you're not gonna be in that right place at the right you time. Gotta you gotta always be, I mean? yeah, I forget. I know exactly the saying that you're saying, but yeah, you always gotta be prepared for the opportunity when it shows its face. Yeah, it's yeah. incredible, man. That's incredible. <laughs> um, and another thing I did wanna talk on too, because you brought it up, um, I was, you know, Gangstar for one, they're one of my favorite duos and groups of all time. DJ Premier is my favorite producer of all time. Um, so I'm very intrigued by, uh, you know, you and Guru working together. And I was curious, because I know DJ Premier put um, 21 years on the uh, New York Reality Check mixtape you put out some years ago, right? Was that, yeah. was that before you and Guru worked together, or was that after you guys had made the connection? Oh, that was like way before, because um, when we put out 21 years, it was, on the flip side, was Father Time. And yeah. uh, I actually remember that completely i was listening to djx 88.1 1 to 4 every saturday that just how it was the only place you hear hip-hop or the hip-hop we wanted to hear anyways yeah and uh somebody called in the radio station 
And they're like, you know, Father Time is dope. And Father Time was blowing up. Don't don't get me twisted. That song, because it went, I think it got Socks' wow. first Warner Brothers deal. And then he was making songs for Batman, the version with uh, what that Arnold Schwarzenegger was in, Ice, because he had a song called Freeze, which was so dope. Oh, I don't know whatever yeah. happened with that. But yeah, like that song blew him up, got him signed, everything like that. And I was listening to the radio station, just happened to, because everybody did. Um, and somebody called in and they used to take calls back when they used to take calls on radio stations live, which was dangerous. Uh, but, uh, and they called in, they're like, you know, that father, <laughs> they're like, yo, that father time joint is really dope, but you really should check out the B side of that record. And I remember DJ X, I like, I remember it because I was sitting there listening to it and he says, yeah, you know what? That B side does not get enough attention. And then put it on. Now, from when he started doing it, I don't know if it was him and he started to spark, but then 21 years just went off. And somehow it got to DJ Premier. And so DJ Premier was putting his reality check 101 together. And then he asked us if he could use it. Of course, we said yes. And uh, he put it on. Then everybody, for a little bit of reason, and sometimes it could still even be out there, D DJ Premier did not produce 21 years. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. Day, which was my uh, my um, uh, my uh, co-partner at uh, Knee Deep Entertainment, um, he produced that. Uh, so just to clear that up once and for all, because yeah. I hear that sometimes. It will be like, did DJ Premier do this? He just took it and put it on his record, which was dope. And then years, a couple of years later, uh, and you know, my steez from 21 years, they went and sampled me in that. So, you know, like our motion was moving and then yeah. it was like, okay, here comes the record. And we did let's ride. I was telling you that Cardi didn't think it would be too fast for me. That's the whole story on his own. And so that's why I recorded on it just to prove him wrong. But then I did it, that record in 97 and, uh, Russ Hergert, who's the person that went and really pulled a lot of strings and made things happen for me. I, I owe a lot to Russ Hergert. Big up Russ Hergert if you're looking at this. Uh, he said, I don't care whatever you put out, just don't do Let's Ride yet. Let me work my magic. So then we had Flagrant and Bear Witness. Yeah. <laughs> And then we did Let's Ride because by then we signed our deal with Virgin. Like he said, it was going to happen and it happened and they did. Everything was great. But he just told me, don't release enough, don't release this record. Leave me with this one. Put out whatever you want to do. And so we recorded with Guru. And then we also had Flagrant, which was produced by Sox. Uh, Bear Witness was produced by Cardinal, actually. Um, yeah. And... Uh, and those, that's why those two records came right before Let's Ride, because I was like, yo, we need something. We're rolling off this Northern Touch buzz. We need something going on. I don't care yeah. what you put out. Just don't put out Let's Ride. And those two came. <laughs> Isn't it incredible, too, like the work of A&Rs back in the day? Like, I know you still have them, but it's a lot it's a lot more scarce, right? Like, I feel like the A&Rs, even at a lot of major labels nowadays, aren't really doing the A&R work unless it's like they're, you know, they're cash cows. That's when, you know, the, it's like they pull all the resources into you know, I don't know, I, I couldn't give you a number, but a certain demographic of the artists on their label, and then everyone else is kind of left to like do the indie hustle and prove themselves. Yeah. You, the you know what it is? It's, it's, it, it's like, I say it in the third verse of Skyline, new blood, new heart, but they ain't birth it. Emergers make them nervous. When I came with yeah. Virgin, with Russ Hergert, Big C, uh, no, Big C wasn't there. Russ Hergert, Spence Diamonds, Keith, yeah, just everybody that was there, it was our thing. We were like, we were proving a point because, you know, like yeah. the whole thing was, okay, Jacques Claire has all this attention. And uh, if his record, like they I pretty much based the structure of Canadian hip hop on my shoulders. They would be like, if this record doesn't do well, then that proves that Canadian hip hop just doesn't sell. And that's me going in. This is right when Let's Ride is dropped, this is September. And we're gearing up for November 2nd or 9th. I, I forget. I think it's the 2nd, but that's our release. Yeah. So we're like, and, and the one thing that I learned is that we always count, count backwards. So we're at like 16 weeks. And so what are we going to do? We're about to do this. So now everybody's basing and all the interviews that I'm doing, they're asking was like, so what do you think? That pressure was heavy, man. It made actually music not fun. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it was like, so if my record, for some reason, I don't know what happens, but if whatever happens, does that mean 
all of Canadian hip hop is going to fail. And then, you know, and they looked at me like, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. What a pressure to have on you, especially like, you know, cause you had been doing the knee deep records thing and you guys had put out music, but like for your like major label debut, like what a, what a pressure to have on your shoulder. Yeah. When we were putting out like our independent vinyl, like it was, you know, there was no pressure. There really was just, it was just the stress of doing it, like mailing out vinyl. That was yeah. like, you will find out that uh, that's hell of expensive. Um, then driving to New Jersey to pick up your vinyl or your record jacket, somehow that you thought it was going to be cheaper. You had to go and put those extra miles in, but like yeah. we were doing it and just doing it and just kind of loving the traction it was going, whatever. And then you get with a major, it's like, you know, like they're, you know, it's, they're a machine. Right. And then they, there's a lot of pressure. And uh, like, I'm not saying that the pressure put me down or anything like that, but it was, I acknowledged that that pressure was there. And, yeah. uh, you know, and for a moment, it just wasn't cool. It wasn't like you were saying, like, you know, like when me and class went in the studio and just banged out seven, nine tracks, seven tracks over three days, or me and Socks and Road Dollar and Cardi just go to the studio and just whatever. Like, it wasn't like how that was. It was yeah. like, you need to get this. Well, it was done already. Now it's like, we need to see the numbers. So I'm like, well, yeah, I, you know, it's just a different type of pressure. But I'm glad we stood up to it. And 35 days later, we had a gold record. And uh, and uh, and that was crazy because I remember I was doing with Master T, big up to Master T, because a lot of stuff wouldn't have happened if he didn't break that through and extend the mix and everything like that. Um, 100%, man. He doesn't get the props he deserves. He deserves a lot more than he gets, yeah, for sure. And uh, he brought them there. And then I'm there. So it was my first TV live appearance on Much Music since the record, the album dropped. And I'm seeing like these ice sculptures saying ice cold on it. And I was like, wow, they did the setup nice. <laughs> but then I'm seeing the business affairs person, the sales person, you know, people you don't see when you go into the right, like you see your promotion, your marketer, your a &R, and you stop and say hi to the VP and the president. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's who you see all the time. I don't see business affairs, but they're all there. And I was like, okay, wow, everybody just came out today, huh? <laughs> That's good. And then that was the day they presented me on air with my gold record on uh, Extended Mix, uh, the Ice Cold album. And uh, yeah, again, see, now I'm looking back and I'm looking at the stuff that happened. And uh, yeah, but that was that all with Ice Cold. It was, Ice Cold was a phenomenal situation. It was great. And it's a phenomenal album too, man. And it goes down as one of the most classic Canadian hip hop albums of all time. And like, I'm, I'm kind of curious too, actually, because you know, you guys like the circle you guys were very, very tight up until, I don't know, it's hard for me to look like, you know, because I was so young at the time taking in your guys' music. I, I'm not going to lie. I, when I was a kid, I didn't know you guys were Canadian. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't even realize, aside from Cardinal, I knew he was Canadian, obviously, because of Cardi slang and, like, you know, the hustling video. That's the first video I ever seen from any of you guys. And he's in Toronto. Like, you know, the tower, like, there's a vacant, like, yeah. lot out at the base of the tower, yeah. like, somewhere <laughs> out there. You know, like, it was before, like, all the skyscrapers and everything. You could see the tower. Um, but um, aside from him, I didn't really ever make the connection as a kid that you guys were all from Toronto and all Canadian. Like, even Northern Touch, I never made that connection as, like, a little seven-year-old and stuff, right? Oh, thank you, baby. Um, so, you know, I, it, it took me until I was about, like, 12 or 13 you know, kind of rediscovering the music you guys had dropped when I was a little bit younger, maybe 14, 15, whatever, you know, and uh, to really kind of, you know, take it in as like, you know, with a more mature mind and be like, holy shit, like these guys put on for Toronto. And, um, but I'm kind of curious, because with that being said, I was younger. Would you say when the major labels came involved and like, you know, uh, Sox kind of went and did his thing and you had Ice Cold and then uh, Memoirs of Blake Savage and, um, um, Cardi, you know, he had Firestarter and then, um, oh, was it volume one and volume two or what was the sec quest for fire was uh, the second one, right? Yeah. 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 But like, would you say is that kind of when the, cause you guys still work together, but I find that, you know, like the circle wasn't as tight, you know what I mean? Like there wasn't I, as much. Yeah. Stuff yeah. You're, 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 you are right. Um, yeah. Uh, because it, like I was saying, it's like these, these sometimes the company and I'm not blaming it. Like I'm not putting the blame on record companies or anything like that. Like record companies yeah. are record companies. They do what they do. Yeah. Um, but if you're in it, they 
drive you in directions, you know, like, you know, like it's hard to swerve out of where they're trying to push you. If they're like, we're going to push you to go and sell 1 million, which is would be great. But if they're pushing you there, you're probably going to get there. If they're just pushing you because they're just, you know, like, yeah, it was my, my, my brother's cousin and he asked me to put him out and they just, and then if you just do whatever, it's a wash there. Yeah. So they move you in certain directions. And I think uh, at that point, because we all just started getting like hot. It's yeah. like ice cold just all came at out. The same time, all too. at the same time. Like ice cold just came out. Socks just dropped money or love at that point. Cardi was oh. just coming out. You know, yeah. Julie was just coming out. So at that point, we're all in our own. We're going in our paths. We're still cool because yeah. like, I used to always refer to Ice Cold. I used to always say that it was our record, which it is, because yeah. everybody from the circle was a part of it. We all over it. We all did and... that. Yeah, we were we yeah. were 10 a.m. to 4 a.m. right in Parliament and Dundas, right at Regent Park, there all the time, at Studio 306 and at Trevis, there recording that record all night long, oh. like. I didn't even realize you guys recorded at Travis as well, too. That's crazy. Yeah, in the basement with Gadget. And that's how I know okay. Gordo and, uh, you know, uh, Strickland, David Strickland. Yeah. He, he's all yeah. over the Ice Cold record. Those guys, yeah, that it, he'll tell you. It would be like, it was, there was never not, there would only be like maybe one of us missing on the recording session when we were recording Ice Cold over there. All of us would wow. be there. All of us. All our cars just parked up. Did you hear gunshots somewhere over there? We're like, close the door. <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's crazy. But yeah, but that's why I consider that record like our record, you know? And it's yeah. just, and like I said, everybody was getting hot and Cardi had his deal. Julie, everybody, Julie and Cardi had some other deals with Warner. Sox was with Def Jam. Uh, me, I was with Virgin. Cardi where was he? He was somewhere. I think he was Sony or something. I don't know. But everybody had something going on and it just kind of pulled us that where the nucleus wasn't as tight as it was because we just all had our own things going on. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, like that that early, um, that volume one Cardi album and uh, Ice Cold, it's like those I think really embody kind of like the, just the vibe that you guys had as like the circle, I think, you know. And obviously the early Me Beat stuff. Um, but I'm curious as well too, um, in those early records, like what what was um when you guys were all producing, because you know you'd have Socrates producing, you'd have Cardi producing, um, you know, you had Day like on 21. I was curious, like, did you guys all have different equipment? Was everyone kind of producing? Or were you guys sharing equipment and just kind of all freaking it, <laughs> you know, freak it, freaking it different ways? Like how like what was kind of the what went into the production in some of those early records? Because the, the it's the just Okay, the, that's the a vibe good is one. Classic. Yeah, that's a that's a good question right there. I'll tell you. Um, I'm gonna. I'm. I'm hoping I'm gonna get these model names right. But it was first we had the EPS keyboard. Okay. I think Socks had that one. I think like only two of us had it. Like Socks had one and Cardi had one. So if we were ever needed to do something, we either go to Socks or we go to Cardi's. And Cardi yeah. was at Eglinton West, and I'm in Scarborough, and Sox is at Port Union. So, like, I'm always over at Sox's house. Um, then he, then they both graduated to an ARS-10. Okay. I believe that keyboard, where Sox actually creates, in a, which is really cool. If you ever listen to a Sox bass line, he calls it Sox bass. And he has Sox bass one, Sox bass two, whatever. He does something. He was so great at manipulating that machine that he created his own bass sound, which is what's in Robin. That brum, brum, that's a Sox bass. Yeah, oh, I don't yeah, know what he took. Yeah, yeah. He took some mustard and some relish and just put it together and made that bass. It, that's his, it's called Sox bass. That's literally what it's called because he created it. Um, so Sox wow. became really good at the AS, ASR 10, I think it was. And then they all moved up into the MP3 and whatever is going on now with the MP3s. And some went back and got some SP12s um, and stuff. But uh, but yeah, it was like, um, no, we would have to go with each other. And we literally would create, like we would all sit, like if we were sitting here right now and Sox had something playing and be like, oh, that sounds good. And we literally would, all of us would start writing on paper. And then the yeah. first one to come up to be like, you know, check this out. And if it was dope, like if it wasn't dope, then they'll listen to the next person. But if it was dope, everybody else, 
needs to rewrite because we're yeah. going with that one. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's and that was how we kind of did our thing. And on the my demo record that I have that has like the just the seconds and what it takes 21 years and apple pie and all these that was that era. That was us yeah. just doing it. Like I like this beat. Let's do it. And we just did like straight like how it, it looks like in straight out of Compton. Just like that. It was just like that. That's awesome. And that and it's interesting too to hear it because that's what I wanted to ask. Cause um to be honest, looking back at some of the stuff, like I can't always tell. Um, you know, especially between like the 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 demo records, the um the Firestarter album and the Ice Cold album. I can't always tell if it's a, if it's a socks beat or a cardi beat like they they had similar aesthetics to them but they still like they had different vibes but you know what i mean there was like some of the like some of the aesthetics of them sounded similar like i can't always pinpoint who produced it without looking at the credits that that's why i was kind of curious if you guys did share equipment and stuff you, like, you know you know what it is it's because we had a sound yeah you did like you, did. you we like you would know that it was a circle affiliated track when you heard yeah. Tara Chase's song come out or wrote dollar with what's wrong girl, you know, yeah. like, you know, uh, I, now I forget what it's called, but I know how the hook goes. Um, but, uh, but like we had a sound, so it was hard to go and decipher like people until like people didn't, until they really started listening to the last line of like, let's ride where I see something, something, something produced by Carter. Now, like I'm literally yeah. telling people that this song was produced by Cardi. And no, everybody doesn't know who produced it. <laughs> so, but yeah, now actually... more. <laughs> sorry, sorry, continue, sorry. Continue. No, no, it, but more people do know know now. But like at the time, they'd be like, you know, they didn't know because I was doing a lot of work with socks and and yeah. uh, other people, and I was like, yeah, I, I I literally told you right before I went into the third chorus who produced it, and uh, so it was yeah. kind of funny. So yeah, <laughs> and, you know, and I think Let's Ride is a perfect example because that actually is one that even like you had to retell me that that was Cardi for me to remember that was Cardi because I'm so like because with socks on the song and the, just the vibe of the beat, like it 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 has a very socks uh like you know sound to it. So it's like I almost just my brain always like forgets that that's um uh, that's Cardi now until like you know I yeah. listen and hear that the verse or look at okay you know. Yeah, you know what? Oh, because I was uh, I I uh, alluded to this earlier about how Let's Ride got started. Yeah. So cassettes. We're lit, sitting in two cars parked beside each other at the government downtown, um, the nightclub. Cardi puts in a cassette, and he has like we're listening to beats. Me, Socks, Cardi, Solitaire, Road Dalla, I think Anthem, Marvel. All of us. We're just all for whatever reason we're there. We're just there. So that beat comes on. So I was like, I like that Cardi. And Cardi always calls me latte for chocolate. He's like, latte, that beats too fast for you, bro. I'm like, nah, man, give it to me. Let me go and rock that. He's like, you know, and so we're like, you know, throwing darts at each other back and forth. So then he says, so I was in the passenger seat of Sox's car. And so Cardi goes to Sox. He says, yo, make sure you're at the studio with him when he does it. So he doesn't do some voiceover thing, whatever he was saying, whatever, whatever. And then how I was saying, because I had 16 or 24 bars at the beginning before I started rapping and I told yeah. Sox to go there. That's why Sox is there was to prove to Cardi that I recorded it. That that's the true story right behind Let's Ride because he thought I couldn't do it. And look at that. Look where it became. <laughs> it took off, right? <laughs> yeah, that's 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 it right there. <laughs> that's amazing, man. You know, and I love, you know, and, you know, for one, I just want to thank you for your time today. And, you know, and I look forward to when we can chop it up again in the future in person and, uh, you know, dig more into the history. But, um, you know, not not that I, I'm, I'm wrapping up yet. I just wanted to say, like, I, I appreciate your time, man, because one thing when I first moved up here to Toronto um, to start doing hip hop media and stuff, like um, one of the big things I really wanted to do was uncover that Toronto hip hop history. And um, I, fe I felt that it was so rich and there was so much there and it never got properly documented because back in the days, all we had was much music and Master T was phenomenal, but they only gave them, you know, a couple minutes of airspace between music videos to talk a little bit with the artists and this and that, you, you didn't get very in depth. And, right. um, and then once, you know, much music kind of 
you know, we all know what happened with much music and it, yeah. it's unfortunate, but, um, you know, and if it wasn't for like, sometimes, you know, dudes like DJ law and stuff, posting these clips online and stuff, like a lot of this would just be forgotten history. Like this stuff hasn't been like properly archived and transferred to digital and, you know, put back out. And there's so much history there, but even with the history that was there watching it growing up, I just felt like there's so much stuff like I never learned through the interviews. I learned through like looking at the album credits and stuff. And I just I've always wanted to dig deep into that Toronto history and really just kind of, you know, like these kind of stories that we're talking about right now, like you guys in the cars with the government listening to the beats and just like, you know, like really get behind the music and what what was going on at the time and what really went into it. So I just for one, I just, you know, before I go any further, I just want to pre say I appreciate your time so much, man, because this is, this yeah, no, is thanks, what man. I really no, I, I appreciate it. And, and, and you're and you're right. And then you're right. And it hasn't been archived properly, because if I go and tell people what my Canadian hip hop history is of people, you know, like I'll tell you about Thrust and Maestro and Dream Warriors and Ghetto Concept or whatever. But like but then there's no in depth into their story. You just know yeah. about them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then now you imagine right now, like for you know, because, um, you know, a lot is kind of happening for Canadian artists in general, um, you know, like so their history or the history is being written from like maybe maybe 98. Yeah, but definitely from 2000 on and they're leaving a whole 20 years before that. You know, so they're only getting half the history. So I definitely think that it should be archived and documented because I know about Kumo D and Grandmaster Flash and Cool Herc and all those guys. But people exactly. may not know about Rumble and Strong and what Dream Warriors did. And, you know, and the parties at the barbecue with uh, like the parties at the barbecue with DJ X, they were what you would consider at the late 90s was the tunnel in New York. Yeah, it was yeah. exactly the same. Just just this building, hip hop and people. Yeah. Hot, sweaty, and big coats. <laughs> but it was just that. And, uh, you know, so that history definitely needs to come out because um, I think people will, will be able to grab a, quite a few nuggets if they learned a little bit more about actually how things kind of came together, got together, and how it and why it's actually progressing even more now. Yeah. And, and, and putting people like Master T in the mix and saying, yeah, if it was like if it wasn't for him, he was definitely a huge piece of everything moving forward into like even to where it is now. Because yeah. if he wasn't there in the '90s, we would have stalled. And that's one thing I was curious about too. Actually, like you know, I, I, one interview I really want to do, I, I haven't ever been too eager on approaching it. I've I've inquired maybe once or twice, you know, oddly over the years, but I don't want to be too eager on it because it's one of those ones I know will happen when it's the right time. But he is one person I really want to sit down and pick the brain of just to, you know, really, because he would have so much insight into all of that Toronto history as well, too, right? But one thing I was kind of curious, just to, on the note of Master T, was it much music that ever kind of pushed to, um, to, to, to kind of show the local scene? Or was it him directly who was like, yo, we have to get these guys on the show? Like, was he the one pulling the strings back there? Or was he kind of like... Hmm. I, I, I know what you're saying. It, you, um, know, you know what I mean? I would say, I don't know, obviously, I don't know everybody that was there. I'm sure maybe there was people that were supporting a movement of sorts. Yeah. But as far as a public figure, yes. Because he was, he, he was the one when Northern Touch came out, right? Extended Mix was an hour. I yeah. remember, I forget, I think it was when they started playing Saturday or something like that or whatever day it yeah. was. And they would bring the audience in at that time, too. Yeah, uh, yeah, inside yeah. to that building so oh, it was an man, hour but because there was five of us master t went to much music and told him that you have to make extend the mix an hour and a half and it happened just for wow. us to do northern touch that but i can't even imagine how much hurdles and ducking and shooking and jiving he had to do while these darts were coming at him to make it happen but he made it happen. And that, I don't know if extended mix ever was an hour and a half, but the one episode it was an hour and a half was when we performed Northern touch. Cause I did my single, the rascals did theirs thrust, did his Cardi did his, like everybody needed their space and that, and master team made it happen. So 
you know, like that's why, yeah, I say he, he deserves way more credit than he gets. And I, yeah, definitely yeah. would love to pick his brain because I'm sure the fights that he had to do to make things happen, I'm sure he's got crazy stories for you. Oh man. And just, and that's like, you know, and it's so important and we don't have that. And, and maybe, you know, it's partly because media now is so much different than it was then. Right. Like, you know, with the internet and stuff, but I just, I feel like we don't have that force. Like, you know, I'm not gonna, I, I, I'm not here to shit on anybody. So I'm not going to mention any names of any programs or any individuals, but you know, there, there, there are a few staples in the city that, you know, put out hip hop content, but they're not, they're not necessarily, I know, you know what it is. It's like, love them, love them or hate them. There's not a, there's not a central word coming out. Like, again, I don't want to keep harping on Master T, but like, yeah. but you know, if you thought he was corny with Roxy and all this other stuff, but that was the word him, Michael Williams on rap city as well. Um, but yeah. that's where we were getting it from. Right. You know, yeah. love it or hate it, but there was a central situation. If you made it to much music, okay, you're doing something, you know, that's, yeah. that was just where now everything is kind of spread out. So you could go over here and that might be cool, but you didn't hit over here. So you need, you know what I mean? Like everything is all yeah. over there. There's not a central si system and uh, you know, and, and I, I think that's why it gets lost. And if, if one thing with it too, is I find that a lot of people and, and I get it, you know, I run a YouTube page and all that stuff too. Like I do understand, you know, clicks are important, but there's a level where integrity is important as well too. You know what I mean? And I feel like there's not really enough outlets out here trying to promote stuff that they think is good to push the culture for it, but more so doing it on the back end of like, this could be good for our program, you know? And that's like, that's the big business way of thinking. And I think, you know, for Master T to be an example and to knock down the doors he did at the time that he did when he's dealing with corporate, you know, I think some of us owe that to him to be able to continue to push that torch forward and not just- You are so- clickbait. You're so right. You know, I won't say who, but I was talking to somebody the other day about uh, radio, just radio and music. And remember, yeah. I remember listening to WBLK in Buffalo before there was like flow and, uh, you know, and, uh, and um, G98 and stuff. Uh, we would get all our music from, uh, from the Buffalo radio station and they would always go and uh, they would play all this music they want to be first to play this song the first to play this the first djs you go into uh, the club you know they play it first i'm the first dj to play who shot you from biggie you never heard it anywhere i got it you know what i mean that was the thing yeah. the radio used to be a thing and then when i went and i talked to him one time and i, I forgot how it came up uh, probably because i had a single coming out and i was talking to him about doing stuff and he literally and this is the music director of the radio station telling me you know what we're we don't break records anymore. We just look to see what's popping on YouTube and add it to rotation. There's no whichever, which goes into like your A&R thing that you were saying about is an A&R at that point. Like I like, like my mom knew my A&R. Yeah. Yeah. You, when you go in, like, look at back in the day, like, you know, like if you look at the new edition movie or one of those things know, like that, movie, by the way, their yeah. parents, your parents knew, the people at the record company, you know what I mean? That's how yeah. involved because, you know, it was, I'm not saying it's not real money now, but it was a real investment. Like I'm investing so much money into you and I'm investing to make hard vinyl. That's a cost itself. And like all this stuff is costing, but I'm into you. I'm into it. where now it's like, you're like, yeah, you know, yeah. Okay. I'll, I don't know what it is. Here's a hundred thousand. Yo, yo, go and record. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll see you. And then you just kind of hang out like homies which is yeah. great because it's great to have homies, right? But like direction, leadership, you know what I mean? Like, especially for the young cats, like we were even just talking about earlier again. Yeah. Someone that goes and takes you and drives you and, you know, makes you better because exactly. they believe in you, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, uh, that- Direction, like, you know, you yeah. invest in yourself in this way. And, you know, it's when you when you make this much off a show, you should be putting this much back into your brand and you should be, you know, whole, break, yeah. break this off to eat off. You know what I mean? And and like, just like very simple little things that I, you know, and, and just even that like, they don't you know, get that people don't get any those little nuggets they don't get anymore. Yeah. And that's, you that's where I think is the loose professionally. You know what I mean? Like dudes don't connect themselves professionally anymore. Yeah. Like, yeah. They hardly. don't. Yeah. A yeah. lot of times it's almost cool to be on, to not be professional, to not be professional and be like, go online and be like, F this guy, F that guy. And you know, this guy's a 
op or this guy's, you know what I mean? But it's like, there's no like professionality to it anymore where it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and these are just all things you need, you, you, your OGs need to teach you, you know, like, I, I give much props to, you know, Chris got rocks, right? But like, he's kind of yeah. like my mentor. When I moved here, he put, he put our show on his station and, you know, he would just always drop nuggets on me. And like, you know, the one thing he always said is keep it pro, you know what I mean? Always keep it pro, you know? And I, you know, just, it's just little things you learn. You're like, yo, like it, it's very important when you're developing and you're coming up, like me in my early twenties, that was important for me to hear to be where I'm at now. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. If that wasn't the case, I might just be smoking weed every day and, you know, bailing out interviews <laughs> and fucking, you know, who knows? You know what I mean? Who knows? Yeah, but yeah. It's just, there's no guidance anymore. And, and one of my, one of my best, one of my best guidance experience, me, Cardi, Solitaire, we went on the road with Razel and we had our road manager. He used to be the road manager for Platinum Blonde, Mark Prince. Oh, wow. So he's seasoned. <laughs> on tour managing life and like I had to like him because he was our tour manager so I had to get along with him but I uh, we we were very cool friends but it was like the, but he was hard on us he would have us in the lobby two hours before showtime really? he would be the car leaves at eight and if you're not there then you got to figure out your way which ultimately meant I had to figure it out way because i was the guy making the money and paying these guys and i need my dj <laughs> so i have to get him a bus ride and it's happened four times that like he would oh leave but the thing that what he did is that uh if it's completely unavoidable i'm never late for a show i always make sure whatever like you know like that was what i got from him yeah. You know, and that was when even if my mind was there and it wasn't, but like even if I wanted to say like, yeah, I'm coming up ice cold, I'm a star. And who are you to tell me to be downstairs two hours before I'll get there in five? You know, I want to be fashionably yeah. late. Like, nope. And he would take your money from it. He'd give it back to you, but he just wouldn't give you your pay. Like if you're supposed to get, let's just say if you're supposed to get 10 bucks, he'd give you seven and hold the three, but then <laughs> give you three, like three weeks later. You know what I mean? But yeah. he would penalize you. But that was the guidance and the leadership that 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 I got, you know, and, and it was great. We're great you know. friends now and we talk and when we go on the road, we haven't been on the road in a while. But when when we did the last time, it's like or I have a show and he's doing sound or something like that. He knows exactly where to get the sound. Like, it's just great. And yeah. I, I yeah, a lot of my discipline I learned from him. And even at the time when you're young, you might be like, yeah, this guy's kind of a dick. But as you get older, you appreciate that. You know, oh, we like, thought wow. he was a uh, we thought he was a <laughs> dick. Oh, man, he was like at first we, we like we were like, yo, what's wrong with this guy? Like we I, I remember Solitaire sitting there and Solitaire would grumble hard to me. Right. So then I have to. <laughs> so then I have to go and approach Mark because Solitaire is telling me a whole bunch of stuff. And I have to go and <laughs> convey it to him, right? And stuff. But like, but it was all to the good. And Solitaire will tell you also is like that guy was solid. And that's why we have some of those things in our head was because of him. We were just young and wild, like young wild guys yeah. with you know a gold record. Let's go on the road. Ooh. Someone had to rein us back, and he was the guy. Yeah, and that's the, and that, that's the thing. And the, you know, those important those lessons are so important, though. You know, like. And, and they, they cause you to be able to take yourself professionally at a much younger age and conduct yourselves and be able, you know what I mean? And if you can conduct yourself professionally, then you can build something for self and then other people under you, you can teach and guide them, you know, but if you're acting like a wild boy, you can't really build up anything of any self work because you're, you're unreliable. So how are you going to build a reliable team? You know what I mean? Like, right. Like, exactly. And everything that happens, everything that happens, um, regardless, if it's, if it's 50 cents tour and 50 cent is staying at the Hilton and something happened at the Hilton, something happened at the Hilton 50 cent. Yeah, exactly. And you know, you know what I mean? And those are the things. So like when we used to go and bring 40 friends on stage, actually, we never really did that. Uh, well, I did when in 96, seven, but like when I started, <laughs> I didn't have the 40 people on stage, but the 40 people would come. Yeah. But then you're responsible for you're not, but you are responsible for what these 40 people might do. And you just hope that they're all going to have a chill night and, you yeah. know, and uh, 
you know, and uh, you just kind of learn those things and, and uh, just a way to go and conduct yourself and, and be yourself. And that's why those numbers are not like that. That's why I never had like the most people I had on stage with me was probably when I'm doing Northern Touch with everybody there. <laughs> like you know like it's not like that crowded convoluted situation so yeah man there's a lot to learn and i've learned a lot and um and these are some of the things that i hope to be able to spread with to other people when they ask me something and you know just something might pop in my head and i'll be like i remember this and somehow maybe give them a nugget if they take it yeah you know? and that's the thing man and that that's the thing that disappoints me the most with the the division I see between like the younger generation, the older generation, because I, like I said, I was born in 89. So I grew up in the 90s as like a kid. But one thing I always took away from hip hop was that you respect your, you respect the OGs and you respect your elders and you learn from them. You know what I mean? And they not, they, they paved ways for you to be able to do what you do. And this is even before I rap or before I did media, anything. Right. But I just mm -hmm. understood that as a fan of hip hop, and, you know, all my favorite artists from the 90s were always showing love to the ones who came before them and the things that they did for them and paved the way. And that disconnect happened, you know, when my teenage years, you know, with the rise of the South and when hip hop went in all these different directions, like on a really mainstream level, not, not that it wasn't always in different, but really, when it really, really shifted a lot and kind of like, kind of became everywhere was putting out really popular hip hop and a lot of it. And there was just like an overflux and like, I feel like that disconnect kind of happened. And then, you know, 10 years, a decade, 15 years removed from that era, it, you have this disconnect. And I just, and that that's the saddest part about it is that the OGs are willing to help the youngins, but the youngins don't have respect for the OGs is how I kind of feel about it. You, you, know, you know what, what I mean? you, you know what, it, you know what, it, where that was? That was when, uh, and that, that was when the digital era took over. Um, yeah. Because when we were still physically making CDs and vinyl or whatever, you know, we were talking about that earlier about like we still we had to get together and make it going. And then you had A and R's and people personally, uh, you know, invested even just emotionally. Like they could have worked for the yeah. record company, but they believe in like I believe in this this guy or whatever so they're personally invested into it and they do it now because when napster happened and then itunes saved kind of like the 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 music industry because the songs were going digital and itunes came in like hey just put the songs here we'll sell them for 99 cents yeah and then all the record companies that was a huge shift mergers make them nervous that's the line that i was saying uh in skyline because yeah. now Virgin is now EMI. EMI now is collaborating with Warner. Warner is being sucked up by Sony. Like, remember, we had, I think, four big record companies. I think there's two Universal and Sony. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. just yeah. underneath that umbrella. And then that was the whole thing. So then the music industry changed um, because, you know, they I did, went digital. But then because it went digital and you had the YouTube come in and all this other stuff, they didn't necessarily need the record companies to go and make them big. It would great. Yeah. It would be great if they had it because you know, like if you're with Def Jam and you get Def Jam money and support and whatever. But yo, you know what? You could just make Superman, Superman yeah. that hope, and it just blows up viral, and yeah. you create your. So you don't need any of that. So that disconnect yeah. comes there because I don't need you, I don't I, need yeah, Puff I need it without you. Yeah. I don't need JD. I don't need Dre. I just Superman that thing right into the next stratosphere. You know. Yeah. And there's the disconnect, you know, and, and then then the mind goes and like if other people aren't on that level, then you walk in that bubble of yeah. just with people on that level, like you completely forget, you know, and you just and you're like, ah, what? Cool Modi? Who's he? Didn't he wear big glasses? My glasses are better than that. Like that's actually what some people would say. It's like, yo, you can't just cool mode these glasses. That was this whole thing. <laughs> well, I love Cool J could, but I mean, you got well, yeah, Cool J. Oh, Cool J. Just, uh, yo, Cool J. Just cool mode these so many times. To the break of dawn, I remember that song. Ice T. I don't know why he keeps going after Ice T, and he keeps going after Cool Modi. I'm like, Cool J, you won that battle. I'm yeah. just waiting for him to say something about cannabis again. I'll be like, okay, KJ, let's <laughs> let's calm down right now, okay? <laughs> well, gym teacher ain't supposed to rap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello, was cool, man. He was. Oh cool. uh, yeah, he, he could cool he could he could cross the line if he wants to, but not if he wants to. If he wanted to, and he does. <laughs> yeah. 
that's one thing you know i like um it's completely unrelated to anything but that's one thing i respect the shit out of for ll man you know he's always been a kind of like an elder statesman to the you know and always kind of he's always kind of helped young talent come up and he doesn't mind putting guys on and stuff like that and you know working with newer producers and stuff like that but like you know and he, he he's got that polishy image you know mid 90s on forward and like kind of you know movie actor guy and stuff but like you say the wrong thing to him and he'll still get in that ass you know what yeah, i mean yeah. he, he'll be super he, disrespectful yeah. <laughs> he still had he still has uh, for uh, the, the people that's listening right now that don't know, he still has I'm Bad, and he still has Radio. Uh, he still has To the Break of Dawn. He still has Mama Said Knock You Out. Like, like Cool J was, imagine being a rapper in New York in the 80s when everybody wanted to be on, but nobody was hiring. You have yeah. to fight hard to get to where you need to be. That's where he came up. And Cool J always got it. He can go and he can be a little bit over the line-ish sometimes. But, you know, he, he, he shoot, his record was called GOAT. He, yeah. he, could, he could do <laughs> whatever he wants at this point. Talk, bro. He started the whole GOAT talk. He did start the GOAT talk, yeah, because everybody was like, GOAT. Yeah. And then greatest of all time. And then, yeah, his GOAT album. That's when the first people started talking about GOAT was when his album came out. He doesn't get the credit for that he deserves either. You know, everybody talks about, like, yo, he the goat now. This guy the goat. This guy to get the goat. Who the goat? LL the goat. Yeah, I'm actually surprised that I remember that he had an album called Goat. But now that I do, I know that it was goat. Like it was, you yeah. know. But yeah, now everybody's a goat. But Cool J is yeah. like, I said that back in '98. <laughs> Y'all thought I was bugging for it. <laughs> yeah, he thought I was bugging for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh man. But, um, you know, not, like I said, um, I'd love to, you know, continue this in person sometime. I don't want to take up too much of your time today. You got the new singles out. I know you guys got work to do on that and stuff. And, um, you know, I would love to get more in depth. Like, you know, in-person interviews are always are always the best. This has been wonderful, though. But I do want to touch on um, one, two more things if you got time for them before we do go. Mm -hmm. um, one being, we did talk about Northern Touch, and I'm sure you've beaten, you know, this horse to death and talked about it in every which angle. And um, so I don't, I don't want to go so much into the story of it. I mean, if you want to break a little bit down of how it came to be, we could talk about that. But one thing I want to ask is like, how does it feel now, looking back? Like, what is, what are we? We're almost 25 years removed from when Northern Touch dropped. Now, aren't we? Close uh, to 98. 98 we're like 23 years or 24 years. yeah 98 yeah like how is it now looking back like and like you know and maybe i guess maybe get into a little bit of how the record came together because maybe that'll help explain but like how is it like you know looking back at how how that whole thing came together and i'm sure by some degree it was a whim how it kind of came together like you know just a record with that many people on it and to see how it's gone down in canadian hip-hop and you know, all these years removed now and to see that it's still like one of those landmark Canadian hip hop records that'll always stand the test of time. Like, how does that feel? It feels really good. Like I won't. Yeah, it feels great. It feels great to know that. You know, if if anything at anything, I know that song is. Canadian music royalty on its own. Yeah. Like it's there with some of the other best ones, you know, so that feels really good um, to know that, like, you know, like it's good to know that, you know, like, yeah, like if they're ever going to do a montage of Canadian music from 80 to 2021, it's going to be in there. Yeah. No question. Like if you miss it, someone's going to be like, why didn't they put that in there? Yeah. You know what I mean? That someone's going to notice. So that's great to see. Um, and it's great. And yeah, like how kind of, Hey, what's up kitty. Uh, how, <laughs> uh, how it kind of get together was you're right. It kind of came up in a whim because at that point I was just releasing singles. Like, you know, like we were doing singles, we were releasing California by Socrates. We were releasing Julie Black's uh, rally and we were releasing songs from mad five. We were just releasing music and I was working at a daycare. I was a daycare oh, wow. teacher. I used to be working for five years, I went, my school finished at 2.30 at Pope John Paul. And I would drive over to Mother Teresa, which anybody in that knows that Scarborough area, like it's like not even maybe 10 minute drive. Um, and I would work at the daycare that was attached to the school. And I would do that every day. And uh, one day 
um, for all you guys that don't remember about home phones, I got a call at work <laughs> and it wow. was Saul Guy. It was Saul Guy, uh, who was the manager of the, the, the rascals at the time. So like, you know, like my boss is like, uh, you have a call. I was like, well, who's calling me? He was Saul Guy. And he said, Hey, we just did this. I don't know how he even got that number. But he's like, hey, you know, do whatever, blah, blah, blah. We want to do this, that, that, and whatever. Just, just thrust the rascals, checkmates on there, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, okay, cool. What date? Thursday. Can you come? Yep. Yeah, okay, cool. Boom. So, again, like how we used to always roll all the time together. This time, Cardinal's in the car with me. I'm like, yo, I got to meet. I think we were meeting Mastermind at the studio that time. And I think it was me, Thrust, Mastermind, and Cardi chopped in the whip. And I picked them up. And then we went to the studio right at Bathurst and... Queen, I think, something like around oh, wow, there. Oh, wow, that's my old neighborhood. Oh, yeah, 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 right around there. We went right there. We went in the studio. I remember Cardi was sick. He had a cold or something like that. So me and Thrust, because the Rascals' verse was on there already, and Checkmate's verse was on there already. Uh, and the Rascals were first, and Checkmate was third. So me and Thrust do rock, paper, scissors to see who's going last, because everybody wanted to go last. I lost. That's why I'm second. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, cause that's the days when the hottest dude went last on the record. The hottest dude, yeah. Everybody wanted to go last, so me yeah. and him, literally, like it's almost a blessing that I lost because I like the position that I was in. But yeah, yeah. I, we did. We literally were like, who wants to go last? I don't know. We like rock paper scissors. I lost. There was no two out of three. It was just whatever happened happened, and I went uh, and I had to go second. So that's why. And the structure of the song ended up there. So then we're like, we record the song, and then. Um, and Cardi's in there and Cardi's in the studio. And so uh, me and Cardi just started writing these things about whatever, these hooks and whatever. And, and like, uh, in a way, that's exactly why Cardi's on the song. Because we were like, we need your animation on the hook. Like right wow. there was just going to be like me, Rascals, Thrust and, and Checkmate. Yeah. Like, I don't know what the hook, because there was no chorus in the song. There was no hook. It was just the parts. And I guess, I don't know if they're going to do scratches, whatever they were thinking of. I don't know what they were thinking. But because I came to the studio with Cardi and then we're like this and we're like, oh, this song bumps. And the Rascal's part's there and Checkmate's part's there. And now I just dropped and Thrust just ended up. And we're like, we need a hook. Cardi, you got that. And go in and rock that. Incredible. And there, there is Northern Touch. Wow. We notorious. And because I was listening to Biggie Smalls and Bone Thugs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. That's where the influence came from. Okay. That's what influenced me. And then yeah. I got that, and then I was like, and then I was, I was thinking, and Cardi was like, I forgot it came up with some part. And then I was like, uh, Rascals, Checkmate, Cardinal, and Thrust. I was trying to rhyme Notorious. Oh, thrust. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, and then we built it from there, and then we were like, Cardi, go in and do it. And then he went in there and killed it. His nose dripping, snot everywhere. Oh, the disinfectant needed to be sprayed all over the place. Then it came out, and that was Northern Touch. <laughs> That's it's exactly how it happened. And it was because, like I was saying, we used to always just go to the studio with each other, no matter what. Socks on Let's Ride, Cardi on Northern Touch. Insane. Insane. <laughs> and like that, you know, I think that was a lot of people's introduction to Cardi. Because that would have been before Hustling, too, right? Uh, no, it was either just right around or hustling was out. He had on with the show first. Yeah. I think hustling would have just dropped there. So it's around the time, but definitely hustling was out first. I just don't know okay, okay. what degree yeah, hustling of is time. A classic, man. That's a yeah. classic record. I think that record gets slept on for how classic that record is too. But um, it's incredible. Like the, you know, how like, you know, these things. And, and as I interview people, you know, over the years, that's my favorite part about interviews is, you know, getting behind the music and learning about these. There's so many little nuanced things that almost didn't happen in so many artists careers. You know what I mean? Like one I always go to is Master Ace. He um, he he was this close to moving to Atlanta because his mom was moving down there and he was going to go down there. Um, and I think he was going to switch schools and go down there or something. But anyways, and he was like, yeah, if I would have went like he's like he, he's like, I almost moved. He's like, I was this close. And I can't remember what he said held him back. I'd have to go back and watch the interview. But basically, there would have been no Master Ace on Juice Crew. You know what I mean? Right. Then following forward, everything, you know, that whole career he spawned, like 
you know, Marco Polo might not be as well known as he is today. Like all the things that spun from him making that one decision, you know what I mean? Like, and yeah. the course of hip hop history, how much it changes. And it's like the same, you know, if Cardi mm-hmm. was because he was sick, never hopped in that car that day. Who knows that without that animated hook, Northern Touch, like it's just crazy. Yeah, it may not have been that track. Yeah. Yeah. If he like, wasn't he's on the really- hook. Yeah. These I little, hear you like pieces. Yeah. It's like, that's my favorite part about learning the history, man. It's just, yeah. Like, it's sometimes little... it's, it's sometimes it's just these, yeah, like you said, it's these little nuances in the story. Like it could have went this way or that way. And somehow for one reason it went the right way and everything else just came up from it. Just snowballs from it. You know, it's like yeah. a butterfly effect really, you know? Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> it's incredible, man. It's incredible. Um, it's a, um there was a uh you know I'll I'll, I'll save it there's a there because we could talk northern touch for freaking hours so I'll, I'll save that but one last thing I did want to touch on um before we do wrap it up um the um baby clues baby blue sound crew joint with Mims <laughs> how did that thing come together because he you know Mims went and popped off years later with this is why I'm hot and stuff but like yeah the cats, if they're not from Canada they don't remember Mims like that you know what I mean yeah uh okay so that was off the baby blue sound crew album yeah yeah so trying to just get all these accurate points down somehow I guess um we would do like shows together. Like we were touring, like, cause baby blue at the time, you know, like that was baby blue sound crew, you know, like yeah. there was four people that only needed one person to DJ, but there was four of them <laughs> and, and they, and they would go and whatever they were touring. So we did some shows and tours and we were all kind of in the same mix. We're all same generation. We're all everything, you know, like we were all that was going on at that moment, not all that was going on, but we were all doing that stuff at the same time. Yeah. And, um, Somehow, because Let's Ride came out and Robin came out, which almost never happened, but that's a, that's for the next conversation. Uh, the, so somehow I got in contact with uh, the, the record companies got in contact because it was on a Baby Blue record. It wasn't for Virgin. It was for Universal. Yeah. Uh, we went into the studio uh, and Mims, they told me this guy Mims was going to be. And then we didn't know. I didn't know who Mims was. I, I think this is probably his first record like being released on a record was on this record. Yeah. And uh, so he was on it. And I was like, okay, cool. And again, it was at Kid Cut's house. Uh, he had a studio in his house. So we went over to his house. And again, they're like, they gave me that talk. Like, you know, his beat kind of got a little double up something. Like, you know, do you think you could rock with it? Sort of, you know? And I was like, are you challenging me right now? <laughs> so... I went there 40 minutes later and then 40 minutes later, I remember sitting in the kitchen and having it uh, play. I could hear it coming out down to the kitchen. 40 minutes wow. later, I went in there, recorded my parts and that was it. And then Mr. Mims was on it. And then that song, then he wanted to shoot a video and then that song did so well. It's actually a hard video to find online. I don't know. It's yeah. hard to find it online. Um, and we watched it today. It may have been years since I seen it. And I was yeah. Like, oh, like it doesn't just pop up on YouTube or something like that. No. Like, you got to really look it up. Um, but yeah, then we went. And she turns you down when you turn yeah. the music up. Yeah. You go out and put she the headphones turns the music. On. Yeah. I walk downstairs and put the headphones on and, uh, and the equalizers going off in on the, the building. The and, building. And, yeah. And we did that. And then we went on the tour. We called it the One Night Stand Tour. And we went on tour. Uh, me. Um, uh, yeah, me and Baby Blue, all of us, we went on the road again. And like, you know, and again, like you said, like just because of that connection, going over to his house and Kid Cut telling me that the beat is too fast for me again. Well, not again, but being the second person to say that to me. And then people want to say, you know, like then the whole lyrics came out, you know, you want to oh, take me to the streets, realize that it's too far. What do you think where they are, where they are, usually is at home doing dishes with your mom or out back playing ball with Paul. You know what I mean? I was like, boom, yeah. don't talk to me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, that, that, that just spawns one more thing I want to ask, too. It's not it obviously probably not a huge question to answer, but um, do you find that you make your best music when you're personally challenged? Uh, not from others, but myself. Yeah. Because I, I find, like, you know, music and people 
it's it's an objective thing. You someone could love it, someone could hate it. Like you know, they just yeah. don't feel it, whatever. So you're never gonna make everybody happy. But like for myself, um, I challenge myself because I I appreciate the skill that I have in rapping is a lot with the way that I flow words and go in and out of the beat because yeah. I like to do that. Like I like to find the holes and weave in and out like the snares here. Okay. I'm going to jump right here. It's weave and come back. Right. Like I, I literally, I think about this stuff. Like it's not like I just rapping. I'm listening to the, that one little thing that happens from the percussion yeah. where that, bongo drum hits and how it hits like i listen to that and that's how i write i don't write to the kick and the snare i write to the bongo the percussion the hi-hat and that's yeah. that's just kind of how i do it anyways so yeah so i really um yeah i really appreciate that type of you know that vibe when it comes to um when it comes into writing type of stuff you know and it's funny actually you saying that too i know i i keep i keep pushing it but it's just uh you know things things you say kind of um they spark other things. But one thing you say about the percussion thing too, is I think that's one thing that kind of gave the circle a sound is that you guys had that raw hip hop aesthetic, but you guys also like, like if you listen to the flag and drums, like there's some other stuff going on in that percussion. That's not just your typical hip hop, like rusty fucking snare kick, like with the, with the hard bass kick and just, you know, a little, um, a little dirty hi-hat, like the, the percussion was very clean, but there was always a little bit of extra stuff going in there too, whether it be like a, not even a cowbell, but you know, like a little like yeah, a, something's like a very there. High pitched shaker, like yeah, over top of the high, or you know, or like uh, like you you mentioned a bongo, like a, like just a little low key kind of just hit after the snare kind of. But you guys always had kind of a like an extra layer to your percussion that I find a lot of hip hop at the time didn't have, and I think that's kind of mm. partly what gave you guys some of your sound. That was actually not that was not on like that was on purpose. We yeah, would, okay. yeah, we, Sox used to always say, the perfect example is light it up. Yeah. Um, I remember we were in Sox's basement, <laughs> just like, what are we going to do today? He's like, I don't know, check out this thing. He's like, and then, I don't know, whatever, we spent 20 minutes and then he left and then, or, then we came back at 20 minutes and, uh, and he was Prince inspired. And I remember him all this time because he's like, he was like, the piano he's like burm, 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 burm. and he was like he was doing it with his mouth and he's like burm, burm. and then then he went into the studio so i'm like literally watching him build this beat like i we built it the same like we built it recorded it and julie came and did her parts later but uh yeah but that was what the focus was on it was like okay here's the base of the beat yeah. what i want everybody to focus on is all the ingredients that makes it you know what i yeah. mean and and that was his thing. And that's why if you notice, and I've noticed, if you ever try to get a band, like a live band to cover that song, they yeah. will always ask you where the one is. <laughs> Cause it starts if it was a four bar loop, the beat starts on the third count yeah. before it goes into the new one. Yeah. But they can't find it they can't they play it so off it's like it's weird like i'll be like okay we're gonna do like you guys practice and they'll get the tone but they're yeah. off the count off the beat yeah <laughs> well, another record that's infamous for that i actually just watched a whole like uh 20 minute piece on it online was uh ludicrous's rollout and it's a great debate between like music snobs all around the world of it starts <laughs> on like the third or that and that's exactly why because the horn progression comes at a different time than the actual like percussion you know what i mean and just, yeah like, yeah but it, it, it's funny like that you say that actually because now that you say that I can yeah that. it's it's exactly that and we and um and it's done on purpose like socks yeah. always rubbing the horn that stab it's like yeah. bam and then he was like oh but you know i don't want to i don't want him to get just stuck on that that horn blast that's why i want to put the bass going boom, 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 boom. and that's another socks bass but yeah like the 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 from when we get the beat and everybody is like sitting there bobbing their head that's just the skeleton the work is yeah. every and they're very socks solitaire cardi i'm sure there's a lot more other producers that do it as well but from my experience being with them that is what they work on they got their frame and now they're figuring out 
what the, what their ingredients are, what they're putting in, this sound, that Intricate, sound, this little intricacies. If, even if it only comes once every eight bars, yeah. but you'll notice it and it'll make a difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, incredible. Well, yo, Sean Claire, man, thank you so much for your time, man. Um, you know, the, the interview went very long, so we're uh, I'll, I'll cut this little piece out of here, obviously. <laughs> so I'm gonna span it over two radio shows. So um, it'll air this Tuesday and then the following Saturday. So we'll split it up and um, we'll do it like that. I'm going to play some of the classic music. I'm going to play all the new songs, but um, just kind of keep you posted on that. But yeah. um, you know, I'll splice us back in here pretty much and go, um, yo, man, uh, thank you so much for your time, Shocks. I, I appreciate it. You know, like the, the history is so rich, so thick, and I can't wait to, uh, you know, have the opportunity to sit down with you in person and, you know, dig more into uh into it but you know for the time being you know you got the new music out we don't want to lose folks the new music <laughs> you got the one day away out and um you got the uh heard everybody which is a little bit older but still kind of the same you know from the same sessions so we're going to yeah. get into playing all those songs now and um you know just let the people know if there's any final final notes you got to say you know before uh before we end it just you know toss them out there my brother yeah, no, I just want to say, yo, thank you very much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. I want to thank everybody out there for the years, 20 years plus support that you guys have been backing me with, you know, like, you know, that it's 2020 and my first single I ever, I ever put out was in 96 and now it's 2020 and you guys have been there and people would be like, why don't you play what it takes anymore at your show? You didn't do 21 years. I'm like, oh my gosh, geez. but for all of those guys like that, thank you very much for all of your support. I appreciate everybody. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, I wish everybody Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Holiday, Season Greeting, whatever it is. I wish everybody peace and happiness over this season. <laughs>